everybody, it's that Sunday School Girl of that thatsundayschoolgirl.com. Welcome to the lesson for this Sunday, June 26th. I hope your week was spectacular. It has been hair bows and perfume, lip gloss, and girly girl central here all week long. I shared that my nieces were coming to town for a week and enjoying Auntie's summer camp. So from tea parties to shopping, movies and the lake, vacation, Bible school at night, we have done it all and had a great time. I must pause and give my annual shout out to parents. God bless you for all that you do. And you do this all of the time. Thank you for allowing me to love on your children and send them back home to you. God bless you for that. But I promise it's been fun. I hope that you have something great planned with your family this weekend. We are wrapping up around here. It is very, very late on Friday night. And I've locked them out for a few minutes while we finish laundry and packing up because we will be on the road in just a few hours headed to Arkansas for the homecoming and sort of family reunion with my mother's side of the family. I am excited that on this Sunday, I have been invited to teach Sunday school at the Common Hill Baptist Church in Hope, Arkansas. So if you are in the area, Hope, Texarkana, Prescott, feel free to come on over. Sunday school is going to be a lot of fun, and I would love to see you there. Okay, so listen, if you're new around here, welcome. You have just joined the largest cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web. I am thrilled that you are here. We do these videos each week for three reasons. Number one, to encourage you to make Sunday school part of your regular weekend routine. Secondly, once you get there, I want you to be able to actively engage in the discussion and dialogue, not just show up and sit in a chair, you know, because I ask you to go. Lastly, when you leave that you're able to activate God's word in your everyday life. So thank you for being here. Go ahead now and hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss any future videos uh, because this is really a lot of fun and we are a great community. So thank you so much for being here and thank you for joining the community. Two more things before we get into the lesson. Next week, I will be headed to Cincinnati, Ohio for the AIM Convention of the Church of God in Christ. And if you are planning to be in Cincinnati, I would love to see you where? The greatest school in all the world, of course. Please stop by the Sunday School Convention. There has been a tremendous, tremendous plan put in place around training quality Sunday School leaders. Whether you are a teacher, a superintendent, a Christian education leader, I promise this is a premier convention and training uh, forum for great Sunday School workers, and you don't want to miss what has been prepared. I am generally hiding in the back of the room. I'm not too, too hard to find, and I would love just to say hello to you as you pass through. So also watch um, on our social media pages. I anticipate a meet up for our social media friends, and you'll see more about that on uh, my page and on the app, so make sure you have your notifications set. Last thing I want you to know before we get into the lesson is they're here. This is July Intentional Living. It is here. And if you pre-ordered yours, it is already gone. Everything that came in through 3 o'clock Central on Friday is out in the mail, gone. Um, excited about it. There are five lessons in the month of July. So this is a 56-page journal that takes you through the daily readings and allows you space to reflect, um, capture your own notes, your prayer thoughts for the day. It is designed as an adult coloring book, and uh, there's a sample of one. There are, I think, three full-color pages in this month's journal, and it comes with a free gift with purchase. I can't tell you what the gift is, but I promise you it's fun and it's special, and it's one of the new items that will be released on July 4th on the website. So keep your eyes peeled. There are a number of new items coming out the 4th of July, and you want to see them. They are going to be fun fun, fun. And one of them, I'm just so excited. I could just burst about it, but I can't tell you right now. Just keep your eyes peeled. It's going to be great. Before I get into the lesson, please allow me to congratulate Kevin Brittman of Horn Lake, Mississippi, who was the winner of our standard lesson commentary giveaway for last week. Kevin was one of 57 entries and we so appreciate everyone who entered. I shared with you last week that standard is one of the two commentaries that I use in my personal study. And the 2016-2017 commentary has been released. What I love about this commentary is that, first of all, I love having a year's worth of lessons in one place. And this one begins in September 
and runs through August of 2017. It does a great job with verse by verse breakdowns, uh, great conversation starters, thought starters for the lesson, and really great background information and even uh, lesson quizzes and end of the quarter quizzes. So just a lot of good solid information. And again, definitely one of my go-to resources. And I appreciate Standard for sending a commentary for me for 2016-17 and seven for me to share with my friends. And so Mr. Britman has the first of seven. That means I have six more to share. So let's figure out how you can enter this week's drawing. This week, I'm going to keep it simple again, but there are going to be two steps to enter. The first thing is that you will need to hit your share button. Hit your share button on Facebook. And I need you to share this lesson to your wall, but you must include a comment. So not just hit the share button and stick it on your wall, but there has to be a comment. So those are the two criteria and we will do the drawing. The drawing entries will end on Sunday at 6 p.m. Central. We will draw and we will post the winner on Monday morning on uh, my Facebook page, on that Sunday School Girls Facebook page, and uh, most likely on my personal page too. So Again, that's how you enter. It's pretty simple. Share, but be sure to include a comment. Let's talk about the lesson for this week. Our lesson title, depending on your publisher, is Ignoring God's Plain Truth. The Bible basis is Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 23 and 28 through 32. The Bible truth. Paul recounts how people will disobey God and take pride in filling their lives with actions that oppose him. The memory verse is verse 20, and the lesson aim is that we will know Paul's plaintive story of God's magnificent creation choosing to wreck itself with sin, feel that humans really do have the freedom to be disobedient, but will suffer God's punishment and do God's will instead of sinning. We spent the last three weeks in the Old Testament in the book of Zephaniah. This week we make the leap to the New Testament the book of Romans chapter 1. Now keep in mind that the title of this unit is Judgment and Salvation. And so we continue down that line of study. Now we know that Paul wrote Romans. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote much of the New Testament being letters to churches that he had visited and in some cases planted. Now the church at Rome is not a church that Paul started, but he knew many leaders there. Paul basically just had great relationships, I mean, such that he could even write back and show concern and to continue to give guidance. Now, the church at Rome was made up of Jews and non-Jews, and Paul sort of had this larger vision, a dream that the church at Rome could be this launching ground where the gospel could be spread to nations as far as like Spain. So he had big vision, but the issue with the Roman church is that they were divided on um, what it, what the meaning of the gospel was. And so it was Paul's intent to try to bring that together for them. As a matter of fact, he uses this letter to explain God's salvation and faith in Jesus Christ. And he especially highlights the coming of Jesus, his birth, burial, uh, death, resurrection, as being the culminating a piece of the relationship between God and Israel. And so the theme of this book is really the righteousness of God. But in order to have that conversation, Paul has to uh, bring to bear the unrighteousness of man. So he starts laying a foundation with the unrighteousness of man. And that's really what we see in chapter one, where we are reading today. Now, chapter one, if you start from the beginning, new movie, new book, Read from the top. I know we start around verse 18 on printed text, but verse 17 is really just his introduction. It's his hello to the church. And then we get into 18 through 32, which is really, it's really heavy information. So let's just say this. So I, when I read this lesson, I was like, oh my goodness, like this is going to be the week that I get lots of ugly comments and there'll be lots of bashing on this one because just of the nature of uh, some of the lesson of the scripture text itself. Not just, it's not my thoughts. It's literally the writing of the scripture. And the real issue I think is that these days we don't like to hear the truth about really hard things, hard conversations. And anymore, it really seems to be the safe place just not to say anything at all, not to take a side, not to be willing um, to, um, 
take the licks that come with standing for righteousness. But the truth is that not talking about sin does not any less mean that sin exists. Um, I was thinking about when I was 14 and my sister and I are 10 years apart in age. So when I was a freshman in high school, she was a preschooler and I had never had chicken pox. And that little girl comes home with chicken pox. And maybe a week later, it was a Saturday night. I will not forget this. On a Saturday night, I looked and on my side, I said, oh, no, it's not what I think. Well, of course it was. I've been in the house with the girl for eight days. That's exactly what it was. But I didn't want it to be chicken pox because it was towards the end of the school year. And all the fun stuff happened at the end of the school year. So that particular week, I just remember that like senior skits were coming up and that was always a big deal uh, when the seniors sort of had their fun day. And so the morning portion was senior skits and the whole school got to come and just sort of have fun and, you know, watch the parody of the teachers and all of that. And then the afternoon, they would distribute yearbooks and the after lunch, we would spend uh, the rest of the afternoon in the gym. And that's where you got your signatures and, you know, you're too so-and-so from so-and-so and See you next year. Have a great summer. All those, you remember the yearbook signing party, or, or did I just date myself? Anyway, Saturday, I see something on my side, and I'm saying no. And I thought that if I just didn't say anything, or, you know, I, I had a shirt on, I could cover it up, that that was going to change anything. But you know what? A couple of days passed, and by Monday, there was no question that I had chicken pox and guess what I was not going to school so my freshman year of high school I have my yearbook there are no signatures because I was home with chicken pox so ignoring them as badly as you may not want it to be there ignoring it did not any less mean that it was there and that is where um, we find ourselves today in the conversation about sin the idea that sin does exist the truth that sin exists and the other truth that really comes up in this lesson, in fact, it's in our lesson A, the truth is none of us has to do what God is asking us to do. He is a gentleman, and I continue to say that he desires relationship with us, but he does not make us have relationship, and we see that so clearly in this lesson. In verse 18, the tone of the lesson really picks up like a courtroom scene again and and here is God he's this judge he's he's a loving God he's a just God he's full of mercy but man he gets angry he has a point where like enough is enough he's he just doesn't put up with our stuff anymore and um I, I thought about it like a slow boil I made some tea the other night and um, I know they say don't watch a pot because it won't boil, but I'm fascinated watching water start to boil on a gas stove. And, I, you know, that's how I really see the anger of God. You see the bubbles there and then you watch. And after a while, there is a rolling boil. And, and that's how I envision the wrath of God. And, you know, the lesson, even by its title, speaks about what happens when you allow yourself into a space where you ignore God, where we ignore God. And the truth is that we can talk ourselves and ration ourselves into anything, but that is the caution of this lesson. There is a such thing as sin. And until man knows that he is a sinner, he cannot truly appreciate the gift of salvation or the grace of God. Now we are commanded to love God with all of our hearts and love our neighbors as ourselves. And Paul actually lays out these two areas in chapter one. He talks about ungodliness, which is sinning against God, and unrighteousness, sinning against man. And as he addresses the unrighteousness of man, we see a declining scene. It says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Why is that so? Why has God reached the boiling point? There are several areas. First, in the intelligence of man. Man has just gotten too smart, meaning that man has decided what he wants to believe in. He, as the scripture says, held down or suppressed the truth in unrighteousness and ungodliness. He has shrouded what he knows to be right in what he wants to believe. What is that driven by? You suppress what you know to be right because you do what you want to do. You want to do what you want to do and you want to make that all right. And after a while, man has the ability to create in his own mind a system that he chooses to believe is right. So he suppresses what he honestly knows to be right. 
The next area in continuing this idea of suppression is about ignorance. It's not that we did not know truth or that they did not know truth because the scripture says that truth has been given, that God gave it to them and showed it to them. But there was a willful refusing to acknowledge that truth, a willful um, disregard for God, no thanking him. And God gives us a conscience. He gives us um, the opportunity to live morally. And we should follow that moral compass, that moral code, that conscience, that thing that kind of tells us when something isn't right. We should not choose to ignore that because that's that that's something on the inside that is attempting to keep us aligned with what we know to be right. But because they have this in this text, man has opted to walk in his own way and to be ignorant of certain things. The result, scripture says, is an empty mind and dark hearts. Without God, man had to worship something else. And we see that that something else could even include himself, thinking that his ideas are wonderful, his ways are wonderful, which leads to indulgence. Because they were so smart and had things figured out on their own, man gave himself permission to indulge in anything that he wanted to do without conscience. And honestly, that sounds very familiar in our world today, that we make up our own systems and you can you can read, read it all on social media. We listen to news commentaries and the things that we hear are not laden with what we know to be true in scripture, but it's laden with so much opinion, which is intended to skew what we think and to cloud what we know about God's word. And it is easy to abandon what we know is true to accept lies because lies make things more acceptable. They make ways of man more acceptable. But the lie that that man believed was that he should serve himself and follow his own ways and not the God that created him. That which was known of God was rejected. Therefore, the Bible says, depending on your translation, or wherefore, God gave them over. This is repeated three times in verses 24, 26, and 28. God gave them over. God gave up on them. It does not say, therefore, God came down and beat them with a stick and made them do what he wanted them to do. God just said, you know what? If that's what you want to do, have at it. And God officially gives them over to their own choices and not just their choices, but the results of their choices. So whatever comes along with that, you get the entire package. Sin had had a field day and there were certain evidences of sin running rampant. One of the things um, that Paul highlights is sexual immorality, specifically homosexuality that began to run rampant. But again, God let them have what was in their hearts. But what again is this evidence? What was the evidence of God abandoning them? Again, sexual immorality. The heart is immoral and the body followed. And the lesson text says that they were behaving in dishonorable ways. It was a culture that was into sexual immorality as a way of life. And you know what? Every generation seems to see something increasing in terms of sexual immorality. I think of, you know, looking even at television ads, like in the 60s, it wasn't common to see certain body parts or, you know, to see, you know, I think pantyhose commercials in the 60s were kind of like taboo, like, oh my goodness, it's a lady's leg. And now everything that we see, you can't even let a child you know, play on a computer, a simple game without wondering, you know, what is going to be solicited or sold in some inappropriate context. And so I think, you know, every generation thinks we've seen this is as bad as it's ever been. And it continues to be a declining scene. The more of this behavior we see, it seems that the higher the approval ratings are. So even our television programs and everything that we see, the music that's available, it seems to shape our culture and it shapes our choices and even shapes aspirations. Our society feeds on the frenzy and we are increasingly in a place where Christians are condemned even if they say anything about it. And then the lesson text speaks to women with women and men with men in ways the scripture says that are not natural. And the consequence is payment for choices. God gives them over to their own choices and they are subject to the consequences that go with those choices. Because they allowed their minds into spaces and did not keep God as the focal point of their minds, God gave them over to a depraved mind, 
What does that mean? It means a mind that is not even capable of performing a right judgment. And God, even today, will leave us to our own choices and our consequences of our choices when we choose to willfully disobey. As the lesson title says, to ignore him, he will leave us and give us over to our own consequences and our own choices. When that happens, he removes from us the grace that has been protecting us from certain things. I believe that there are certain things that cannot get to me because of the grace of God that covers my life. But if I choose to willfully walk outside of the grace of God, I lose that covering. I think about it even in terms of being in my parents' home. There were certain protections that came with being in that home. And had I made choices to live other lifestyles or do other things, I would not have had the covering of that home and the protection that went with it. And I see that in the same way as just how God covers us. But again, in the lesson text, we see that he turned society over to the results of what it determined to be its own freedom. And then Paul runs a list down. There were 24 sins listed in the scripture text that become classic uh, descriptions of what happens when God gives up. And these persons committed these sins, not just themselves, but they encouraged others and took pleasure in others sinning. In fact, they celebrated others when they sinned. And then Paul writes it this way in verse 20. He says basically that ignorance is no excuse, that there would be no excuse for this kind of behavior. We're going to continue next week. We're going to pick up in chapter two, I believe. So we'll continue this, um, this discussion, looking at how, you know, what happens when we fall into these places. Uh, the next unit title is A World Gone Wrong. And I think you'll see so many similarities with what we're looking at. There's nothing new under the sun. And some of most of the scripture, we can take it today and cut and paste it into 2016. And it's like we're dealing with right now. Here were my lesson learnings from the week. First, I reflected on the lesson title from this week, Ignoring God's Plain Truth. It's plain truth. He's not trying to shroud it. He's not hiding truth from us. God has given us his word. He's given us his word and he gives us access to him in our devotional times and in our prayer. He wants us to have that relationship with him. There are two paths in life. There's God's path and there's the path of sin. But God wants us to love him and he wants to love us back. But he's not going to fight us or wrestle us down or beg for that relationship. There is a point where when man has given over to his own ways, his own actions, his own ideas, that God chooses to walk away and leave man with what he wanted, his own choices. It was in Matthew 15, 15 that Jesus said, leave them alone. Generally, it is people that abandon God not God abandoning people. But again, when people prioritize their choice, their stuff, their own freedoms, God says they don't need me and he walks from them. Interesting question I've heard a lot lately. Why do bad things happen? Why does God allow certain things to happen? Well, it's interesting for me because in so many contexts, God is ignored. He's not acknowledged. He's not... Um, He's not a thought until calamity arises. And then certainly he is charged as the individual who allowed it to be. Well, the lesson tells us that there's a strong causal link between sin and its consequences. The next thing is don't lose your conscience. Don't lose your sensitivity to sin. There is something on the inside that God has placed in us, especially as believers. We have his spirit that tells us when something isn't right. And we shouldn't lose that or lose voice for that. When God removes himself from a situation, he abandons you to your own activities, thoughts, and agendas. He removes the grace that has been sustaining you up until that time. And he allows you into a space where whatever happens, happens. And so for me, I want to live with a conscience, with an awareness of what it is that God's requiring because I don't want to be turned over to whatever happens, happens. So that is the lesson for this week. We're going to continue next week. In fact, our new unit study is called A World Gone Wrong. So we're going to continue, I believe, in Romans chapter 2, where we will continue looking at this letter that Paul is writing as he continues to try to explain uh, this unrighteousness of man. So that's the lesson for this week. 
would love to hear any thoughts that you had. Again, I suspect that just based on the content of this lesson, particularly uh, the conversations around um, sexual immorality and homosexuality, I expect that your discussions will be very spirited this week. And so there'll be um, lots of thoughts on that. But I would love to hear what you thought about the lesson. And I look forward uh, to your shares this week. Please tell someone about this video. Uh, be sure to like the page and that you've downloaded your app because there will be good information coming for you in the next few weeks. That's the lesson. Have a super fantastic weekend. And I will see you in Sunday school. Bye-bye.